Today's episode of Monkey Ball on the Monkey Sports Podcast is brought to you by Baseball Monkey. Next time you need any baseball equipment, go to BaseballMonkey.com, plug in promo code PODCAST10, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, the number 10, one zero. That will give you 10% off your entire baseball order at Baseball Monkey. Little things, big things, whatever you want, 10% off, PODCAST10, some exclusions may apply, BaseballMonkey.com, Monkey Ball Podcast. Brought to you by Monkey Sports. Let's get into it. There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's us. Welcome into Monkey Ball, brought to you by Monkey Sports, the ultimate baseball retailer podcast. Got a good episode for you today. A fun one for me personally had Andrew Feltz from the Round Rock Express, their director of communications and public relations. My older brother, person that's been in AAA baseball for about five years now, he gives us a very interesting interview about where the minor leagues sit as far as the you know, conversations with the MLB and the Players Association, a little bit of just you know goofy minor league talk mixed in there too. So a very fun one. Um, very grateful to have had him to come on the episode. We got Hank with us too in studio. Hank, how are we feeling today, Hello, buddy? Hello, welcome back. Field sport guy, just taking over the outdoor Yeah, all sports. field sports, man. That's uh, baseball and lacrosse. Not really comparable, but we're here talking about it. Same you know. time of year. Yeah, outside. Right, right outside. Lots of grass. Yeah. So there is some turf though in baseball fields now. That's kind of starting to take over. I feel like that'd be awful. Like you feel like I feel like when you see like the stadiums, I think the Blue Jays had this for a long time that the infield was turf mm-hmm. too. Yep. Sliding on that has to be just horrible. So my my high school was was like one of the first turf fields in like the state and if All you turf, slid, no dirt. No no the only thing was dirt was well, the, the pitching mound. Yeah. And even then they got rid of that recently. Um Jeez. if you slid you would slide for like 5 10 yards. Like you zipped cuz it was really short turf. I guess you wear pants though mm-hmm. in baseball so it's I not mean, that the bad. sliding is The ball the ball moves on the turf. It's fast. Oh, I bet that. Yeah, awesome. I bet it. I've always thought that's unique. We're completely divulging already, but it's fine. I've always thought it's, it's very <laughs> sports where you wear a belt. I think it's so weird. Football and baseball you wear belts. L- yeah, I guess so. You wear like football. You kind of wear like the nylon, or like the yeah, like the nylon, I guess. But, but like you, baseball, like they were like leather belts. Mm-hmm. They were like the belt I'm wearing right now, basically. Yeah, with like a metal bit in the front. Wild. Gotta that's so weird up, to man. me. Well, you gotta think I you're guess, like, but you're always falling down and stuff, though. That's yeah, that's true. And you're sliding around like not like you would be in basketball or something. You probably wear belts in more sports than we probably should you don't. wear more belts. I mean, hockey. I guess it's not really a belt, but there's like garter full, belts. Like some guys wear those, like yeah. to keep up their socks. Belts, belts in baseball. Weird. Anyway. Let's talk about the news that's going on in baseball right news, now. News, 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 news. MLBPA and the MLB still uh, on opposite ends of the room. It they feels love like. each other. They're best friends. Apart from the, uh, <laughs> I forget who tweeted it the other day, and of course, you know, duped everybody about like, hey, they're finalizing everything, and then the MLBPA was like, this is not true. It's like the Takashi Six Nine when you slap the table, stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the chance. Yeah, God. That was the only thing mess. I thought about when that tweet came out. You sent it to me. I, I did laugh pretty because the PA was, was just though. like, there's no agreement. <laughs> it's bad, man. It's like. Yeah, I feel like a month ago I got on and I was like, well, you know, they should play baseball. And I kind of not necessarily took the side of the owners, but took the side of like, I'm a baseball fan and I want baseball to be played. You were very pro. Let's get back yeah. to playing. When and we I had still this podcast want, a month ago. I still want to obviously see baseball. But at this point, it's like the owners clearly aren't going to budge. And I don't think the players are going to budge. No. And so I hate to be pessimistic, but like. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if we see MLB players on the field in yeah. 2020. I mean, like we said, this is you know June 18th on a Thursday. Uh, a tweet. Yeah, it would be like game 60 today. Yeah. Uh, a tweet a while ago was talking about how the PA is going to offer up a 70-game schedule with, I think, the pro the full prorated salary. Mm-hmm. Don't know what that means for anything else, but that's just kind of the initial rumblings right now. I saw Woj retweeted it at like noon today. I think that's what the players want. I mean, what, what has shown, I think that MLB, the owners, have given up three propositions and pretty much everything factors into like a third of players pay. That it's just been said a different way. Like, okay, 120 games at like a certain percentage or a certain pro rate, and then oh, we'll play 30 games at like a certain pro rate and a certain percentage. And every time it's come down to like a third of the salaries, and like the players aren't that dumb. No, and that, that's ridiculous. The I can appreciate that all the players are like, okay, give us a time and place, and we'll play. But like, I don't know if that's necessarily their real sentiment because. Uh, the option has been there to play and you know everyone tweeting like give me a time and place like no the players are fighting for it as they yeah right exactly it's like it's from a fan i'm like oh awesome like my heroes want to play but at the same time it's like well 
we're on round 10 of everybody trying to figure everything out like i don't know and it's almost july and there's yeah. just there's i mean you got to think there's got to be some sort of spring training that's gonna happen too you're not gonna just dump them into game one right mm-hmm. and so yeah, what's and, that gonna look like and andrew talked about that too and then like that's why i think it's kind of perfect timing to have had somebody representing minor league baseball on the podcast today because mm-hmm. it's like the the mlb is you know just the top tier like okay so you bring it back and you said we're gonna play 70 games what happens to the triple a guys what happens to the double a guys what happens to the guys that just got drafted that are like fighting for positions and everything like mm-hmm. are you gonna play 10 single a games or short season or whatever like if you're gonna give the opportunity to some you think there would need to be some contingency plan and yeah some kind of spring training to where you don't just say all right first games next week everyone go out and tear your acls or right. like I mean, yeah, and baseball guys, I feel like notoriously will just hurt themselves after waiting for too long. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you, you know, you play nine innings, you're not running that much every day the of field. the year. <laughs> right. And like you're in the batter's box, you hit a dribbler to third and you sprint full out. I feel like I saw a lot of guys hurt their quads and mm-hmm. stuff like throughout my life of watching baseball, just running to first base because you go from not running for like an hour to a full sprint. And I'd be worried about guys coming back and, and being so bad out of shape that yeah. it's just going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's unique. Um, it was cool, too, to talk about like the TCL and leagues that are starting to come back, you know, collegiate wood leagues and stuff like that. Um, when we get into it in the interview a little bit later, but kind of what some AAA teams are doing and just the, the obligation to community that they feel to try to bring back events and bring back baseball to some extent. So hopefully there'll be more of things like that. And guys do get the opportunity to play this summer and, you know, it can dribble into high school and everything like that. But as far as where the program sits again, I, I hate to be pessimistic, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it just takes one random meeting on some day where it's like, we're back now all of a sudden. You know what I mean? It just, it takes that moment. Yeah. And it's, it seemed that way with like the NBA and the NHL and stuff. It's like rumblings, rumblings, rumblings. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, here's the plan. Here's what we're doing. So I'm hoping again that something similar happens and I'm hoping that they can come up with something. But even so it's like, okay, are you going to put them all at Disney or are you going to put them all in Dallas or all in at spring training ballpark or whatever like right. I, I don't know there's there's so many things that are in the air and sidebar tangents uh the nba guys who are uh, going to be on disney's campus uh apparently they're getting early access to all the disney movies they're supposed to come out this year yeah the i like Black saw Widow? what they were supposed to get yeah that's kind of uh, sick it's gonna be pretty fun and then i saw someone tweet it's like who's the first nba player to leak an entire movie out <laughs> <laughs> damian lillard is just sitting there with his no, phone not on Dame. IG live no it's gonna be like uh it's gonna be russ let's Jamal be honest Murray or somebody yeah, or it's gonna be bad <laughs> Kyrie fighting. It, yeah, Kyrie starts his own league and he just streams every movie that the NBA offers. What? So speaking of that, I, I don't know why I'm just a big NBA guy. What M- MLB player do you think could have the amount of political cachet to say we should start our own league in defiance of this league? Dude. You know what I mean? Like yeah, who could yeah, stand yeah. up and just be like, no, we're doing our own I, thing as players? I don't think anybody. I mean, we talked about it with the baseballologists talking about like just the faces of the sport mm-hmm. and like how people have weight and i don't think there's anybody in baseball that's bigger than the sport i don't think bryce harper couldn't because everyone hates him sorry right bryce exactly. and like mike trout would be the only one that could and he doesn't have the he doesn't have the clout like no. i uh, he just feels like a dad yeah exactly if he came out like let's start our own league everyone would be like huh like who's this guy what's this like, guy oh, yeah, he's pretty oh, good, it's mike trout right it's uh, it sucks like there are people yeah that are transcendent to basketball and there are people that are probably transcendent to football but i don't think baseball has that and i think the mlb I mean, I think they've proven that they've worked very hard to keep it that way, right? Yep. Like, Centralizing they don't want all the media. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I wonder. We've seen that. it with this this back and forth between the players and the owners. Like nobody can get a foothold because they think they're on level playing fields. You I know? think the last guy that could have done it would have been like Jeter, like yeah, prime Griffey. primo Jeter. Yeah. I don't know about. Yeah. I don't know about. I feel like Jeter just has a weirdly like political vibe to him, to where he could just be like, "We're leaving," and everyone be like, "Yeah, we're done." I mean, he. Now that you put that though, Jeter could be a pretty big piece for either side of. The negotiations going right because right he's now. been on both sides of it, right? Yeah, exactly. After destroying Recently. the Marlins for no yeah. reason. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, God. What, what's their plan? Is it just devalue fan. them so much they can sell them? Like, what's the plan? I, I can appreciate, like, as a small market fan, like I've always grown up a Royals fan, so I can appreciate like being really bad, getting a bunch of draft picks, developing them, and then trying to be good. And I think that works. Like, you can kind of look at like I'll yeah. take ten years of being bad to go to back to back World Series. Like, that's cool. But then you look at like what the Marlins are doing, and I think they're billing it to where they're trying to do that, except for they don't have the farm system in place, and, and they don't really have the Band-Aids in place. And they're in Miami, level. you know, the small market. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, still. Theoretically. What's with Florida's teams? They're just weird, just in general. Yeah, I agree. Tropicana is an awful place. How's that going down? <sighs> Who knows? Should have been 10 years ago, but. I, every time I watch games there, like highlights and stuff, I, the turf looks like it's weirdly like iridescent. Like It probably is. It like reflects back. I'm like, are there waves in the turf? Yeah, it's bad. Good, good rebrand though. When they went kind of to change raise? like the Miami Marlins and 
Oh, I thought you were talking about the when the Tampa Bay Rays, no, no, which no. is just the Rays. That was a great. When movie. they were the Devil Rays, though, and they had the the jerseys that said Devil Rays that were in camo, those were sweet. Oh, I prefer just. They the were Rays. good then too. Like Evan Longoria World Series a couple of years ago, oh five maybe. A couple of years ago, yeah. a decade and oh, a half. A couple ago. years ago, yeah, like fifteen. All right, we're all over the place with this baseball pod. Let's get into our interview. Andrew Feltz, my older brother, Round Rock Express. Public Relations and Communications Director. Good interview with him. All things talking AAA baseball. Talk about a little bit of monster trucks. Stick little around bit of for the riding. monster trucks. Yeah, there's some crazy I'm stuff in AAA. My mind. And uh, if you it. are not a minor league baseball fan, let this interview change your mind. But let's get into it. Andrew Feltz of the Round Rock Express. All right, welcome into the Monkey Ball Podcast. Andrew Feltz, the Manager of Public Relations and Communication for the Round Rock Express. Andrew, how you doing? I'm great, thanks. Jason, how are you? I'm good. Good to uh, good to talk to you again. Thanks <laughs> for taking the time to come on the podcast. Yeah, of course. Happy to do it. We were just joking about how it's you know it's taken me this long to finally hop on and get on with you guys. So I'm excited. Yeah, glad this is finally working out. And I think kind of the perfect time too, with obviously everything that's going on with baseball and minor leagues and major league and you know obviously crazy times. So good to good to get this uh, going. But before we get into all that, just for everybody out there listening, give us a little bit of kind of your background into what's led you to the position that you're in now with the Express. Yeah, of course. Um, I kind of always thought I wanted to be a sports reporter, uh, journalist, always kind of enjoyed writing, enjoyed covering sports. And so that's kind of what I thought I wanted to do in college and started to go the journalism route and took a couple classes and I thought, you know, I don't know. And it actually switched majors from journalism to sports broadcasting, a little more focused on what I wanted to do. And from there, kind of fell in love with the, the team side, the team communication side, getting to write from the perspective of a team and kind of put your spin on it. And it's, it's more positive. And it's when I was at, at TCU coming from the university and now, of course, the Express it's coming from our club. And so that was kind of where I first fell in love with, with this, this role and this type of work and this type of writing. And I was really lucky after I graduated from TCU to to get an internship with the Texas Stars hockey team uh, in Cedar Park, close to home for me, uh, being in Austin. And then that internship led to uh, another internship with the Express in 2016. So I, I spent the, my first year with them. Then uh, I was hired full time at the end of that year, and then was promoted a couple of years ago to the, to the role I'm in now. So it's uh, this will be my fifth season, you know, assuming we have a season um, coming up. But it feels like it's been no time at all it's crazy how much uh how much the time flies so i mean we'll, we'll you alluded to it right there but we'll kind of get right into it as far as you know if you guys have a season obviously all the news and everything coming out has been about the professional leagues and the mlbpa and the mlb kind of going back and forth between if they're going to play how much they're going to play how much players are going to get paid all that stuff but what's seemingly you know been left out of all these conversations is minor leagues and guys like you guys that are you know the highest form of the minor leagues there's almost no representation so where does it kind of sit right now with you know the MILB and, and everything going on that's not at the major league level and maybe not getting that same coverage well yeah I'm glad you said that I think that that's um, maybe a common misconception that, that a lot of people have is that minor league baseball is somehow has a uh, you know a financial or an ownership kind of involvement with major league baseball which some clubs do there's some some minor league clubs that are owned by their their major league affiliate but the vast majority of them are not we're small businesses we're privately owned we're in you know 160 different markets all across the country and so it truly is a small business a small industry it's it's you hear about baseball and it's you know baseball made 10 billion dollars last year and all this but it's very different the major leagues as compared to the minor leagues and so exactly what you said when they ha they're having these negotiations it's the major league players the major league owners going back and forth which of course they have to have a framework and a plan in place to be able to play before they even get to the minor leagues and so throughout all this back and forth and the different negotiating the different plans the different pr uh, proposals that have come up the minor leagues have just kind of taken a back seat to all of that because we're going to come second no matter what and so yeah it's been it's been tough for our our position you know just the unknown we don't know we can't do anything until Major League Baseball makes a decision until they have a plan in place. And then they start kind of assigning players and they have to pick spring training back up and figure out their minor league roster. So it's been a long waiting game for us. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this later, but having a facility and a venue sitting empty is not, you know, a good thing for an organization like us. We're an events-based business. We make our revenue every year by hosting baseball games and concerts and soccer and all sorts of different events out at the ballpark but it's just been a very strange situation and we're 
kind of we're like the, everybody else, and we're hearing stuff through Twitter and, and refreshing every five seconds at Sports Center and the whole deal. And I think people think that we have, you know, some sort of insider information. We really don't. We're just we're at the mercy of Major League Baseball. We're waiting. We're trying to hear. And it's not just here in Round Rock. It's like I said, the other 159 other clubs all across the country are, are in the same boat, and everybody's kind of approaching in a different way. But overall, it's um, it's yeah, just kind of sit and wait and see what happens. <laughs> So you mentioned sort of being more of an events-based business. Has there been any plan to use the current facilities for other maybe concerts or games or anything like that to fill that space and try and get some extra revenue here during like a dead period? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's a, another great question. So we, of course, have been kind of waiting and, and as, as the governor here in Texas kind of mandating what businesses would be open, what businesses needed to close, the social distancing practices. We, of course, uh, early March closed our facility cancel the rest of our events that were on our our calendar uh you know nobody and nobody out we're following these guidelines from from the state from the county from the city and we just waited it out i mean just like everybody else every business movie theaters and bars and restaurants we were you know in that same boat from that standpoint and then as things kind of over the last four to six weeks started to open up and you know restaurants were allowed to start opening at, at capacities and then they added sports venues in there and outdoor events and so we have we we've kind of shifted our focus a little bit from you know sitting around waiting for a minor league season to hey what what are some things that we can do in the meantime that are socially distant that are safe that that are exciting to our our community and our fans and ways that we can kind of give back to those folks and so I mean we've got a really wide variety of of events we're showing some movies on our our jumbotron you know inviting people to bring out have blankets kind of social distance yourselves in the outfield um, we're having a concert on the fourth of July same thing we're actually going to paint um, like little pods on the field that are all six feet apart and sell those pods to families and groups and um, ha- allow folks to come out and be socially distant, enjoy a concert and fireworks. We're allowing folks to come out and take batting practice um, on a professional field, you know, uh, unbelievable experience that wouldn't be offered any other time, but something like this, same thing. Our, we have a swimming pool out in right field. We're renting that out to parties and groups and, you know, come out to the ballpark. We've got, this massive facility, we've got the space, we, we can do it safely, we can follow these guidelines set forth by by the um, you know powers that be. So, yeah, it's been a, a shift in our business and our way of thinking and how can we utilize this facility while we're sitting here waiting for baseball. You mentioned having players assigned and winning for the MLB. Do you guys currently have like guys on roster that are just sitting around waiting? Has there been any interaction between coaching staff and players on training regiments? How is that kind of shaken out throughout this whole process? Yeah, that's a, uh, another great question. So with baseball specifically, as compared to the other sports, we, I mean, spring training had just barely started. In fact, another thing I think a lot of people don't realize is there's kind of two spring trainings. There's a major league spring training and there's a minor league spring training. And the the minor league spring training, I think, had started maybe the day before or two days before everything shut down. So the for us being a AAA club, a lot of our players were – in major league spring training. And so they'd been there for a couple of weeks training with the major league guys and, you know, competing for roster spots. But the other half of our team had just barely gotten to, to West Palm beach, Florida for, for Houston Astros spring training. And so the rosters hadn't really been decided. Guys weren't sure if they were going to be here in round rock at triple a, maybe in Corpus Christi and double a, or some guys that maybe had a shot to be, you know, the 25th or the 26th man for the Astros that are kind of in limbo. And so everybody kind of had to go home. And so in our communication with, with some of our players that, that we felt confident were probably going to be back in Round Rock this season. You know, everybody's kind of has a different story. Some guys, you know, have literally have keys to their high school complex. They go out and they're able to throw, they're able to hit, they're able to work out. Some guys are working out in their garage or, you know, at the neighborhood gym or wherever they can kind of find a place. Um, but as far as the coaching staff, we've been in communication with, with our manager and he's, kind of in the boat with the rest of the the minor league coaches in the Astros organization of providing assistance where he can, kind of giving these guys tips, ways that they can stay in shape, stay healthy, um, just stay ready to go. And the one nice thing about the timeline and and kind of the return to baseball is there would be, we think, seven to ten days between when a decision's made ultimately and when players would have to report to spring training and then probably another three weeks or so of spring training. So a lot of these guys – will have the time to ramp back up, uh, you know, do so in a manner that's conducive to, to a normal season where they're not, you know, just all of a sudden going from no innings to 30, 40, 50 innings and, and you know, risking injury or risking permanent damage down the line. But 
yeah, a lot of these guys, they're just kind of in the same boat as we are, where they're just, especially on the minor league side, sitting and waiting for some sort of a, a decision and trying to stay in, in any kind of shape that they can. So you had talked about kind of all the things that uh, that you guys were doing just at the ballpark and keeping the community engaged and stuff. And I think that's something that's not necessarily unique to minor league baseball, but a lot bigger of a thing in minor league baseball is just how active in the community a lot of these teams are. What's kind of been their response to what's going on and everything right now in the community? And what have you guys seen from just Round Rock or, you know, Austin or any surrounding area of people that are kind of waiting to get stuff back going? Yeah, and you know, uh, what's kind of interesting about about that, the, what I do think is unique to, to minor league baseball and probably minor league sports in general is a lot of our fans are not necessarily baseball fans. They, they're, there's, a, there's definitely a group of people, a population of people that come out to watch baseball, and that's their diehards, their Astros fans. They know the prospects. They score the game. They listen on the radio, the whole thing. But a lot of our fans, it's, it's fun. It's affordable. It's family entertainment. You know, you can come out for six bucks a person and drink a beer and sit on the berm and, you know, play Jenga in the, the beer garden. And, you know, there's promos and concerts and all sorts of stuff that goes on during our season. And so – that I think has kind of helped us a little bit during this um, because, you know, we, we kind of say we don't compete with other sports teams. We compete with movie theaters and we compete with the shoulder bond and we compete with, you know, if you're going to take your family out and go do something for an evening and have fun and spend some money on entertainment, you know, we kind of provide ourselves as, as an affordable option. So from my standpoint on the, on the PR side, when our season first got suspended, uh, you know, I kind of went into, you know, my, my panic mode of, all right, here we go. We're going to get bombarded with fans, with sponsors, with partners, with vendors. All these people are going to say, what's going on? What do we do? What happens to my tickets? You know, what, what's the plan? And we don't have a plan. Um, at the time, it was, it was fresh. It was, this was obviously new territory for everybody. Uh, every business, you know, on earth basically is having to deal with this for the first time. And so we were kind of gearing up and, and we were just ready to go. We were arming our salespeople with with verbiage and, and what are we going to do when they call and they start showing up and asking for refunds and this and that and the other. And we really never saw any of that. E- even to this day, there's been a handful of folks that have reached out and, and asked about the status of their tickets, but it's, it wasn't nearly like the swarm of, of questions that I was kind of anticipating. And I think kind of has two things. It's, it's folks that understand that, that we're going to do the right thing. And at the end of the day, you know, if you spent money with us, if you bought tickets, we're going to make it right one way or the other. It might be in 2021, it might not look like it was originally structured when we built our schedule for 2020, but I think a lot of people understand that. Um, and the other thing too, just with the nature of this pandemic and and the way that the economy is is reacted, and you have people that are are getting sick and that are losing their lives and losing their jobs and losing their businesses. And so I think, you know, baseball was kind of maybe not at top of mind when this kind of first happened. So those two things have been. Uh, been a little bit nicer and a little bit easier to deal with than kind of what I was anticipating off the bat. So talking about in-game events and people just coming out for a a laid back time in the park, what are some of the craziest in-park events or activities you guys have done over the years? So whether pie eating contests or there guys running around the outfield, what kind of stuff have you guys done that have been a little bit more on the outside crazy minor league ballpark PR stuff? Oh man, see this is my favorite my all-time favorite thing about minor league baseball is, yeah, there's so many off-the-wall, quirky, goofy things. I will say this forever, probably. It's going to take a while for us to, to come up with an event that tops this. But my the end of my first year with the Express, we had a, an event here at the ballpark. It wasn't related to baseball, uh, but it was called Buckin' and Truckin'. And it was a <laughs> monster truck rally paired with bull riding. And so we... At the same time, we were, or...? At the same time, we were in the process of we were getting a new field, um, and so the we had a you know we so just trash for a, the old one you know, construction company yeah to come <laughs> and and replace the field, and so we said you know what let's blow this thing out let's just yeah monster trucks so they came in they laid dirt they had jumps and the whole thing and I, I was a little skeptical at first like how are you going to fit a monster truck track you know, on our footprint but man it was not only did they do it but it was awesome we had the bowl kind of the bowl shoots really near home plate, kind of between first and third on the infield by the pitcher's mound. The monster trucks were from second base to the outfield, and it was just an <laughs> unbelievable. And the the place was packed. I mean, we did something like 13,000 in-house on, on that night, which that's like a 4th of July baseball game for us, um, that kind of that kind of crowd. And so that was crazy. Uh, on the baseball side, there's, there's so many. Um, we actually, at Dell Diamond here in Round Rock, 
AMC used our facility to film uh, season four of The Walking Dead, or sorry, Fear the Walking Dead, and that was a whole other adventure in and of itself. But after that season aired, we had a theme night at the ballpark where we wore the jerseys of the fictional team from the TV show, and we had the whole cast and crew came out, and they were in a suite, and they kind of waved and you know threw baseballs to folks, and they had some of the the walkers from the show all dressed up with their um, <laughs> all their makeup on, and that that was a really fun night. You look at too, some of the players that, that have come through, and this isn't you know quirky minor league baseball stuff, but one of the fun aspects of, of being in the minor leagues and being in AAA is the rehab assignments. When we have these superstars from, from our major league affiliate that are, are needing to get some reps in, we had Jose Altuve here last year. Carlos Correa was here for several games. Um, going back to our affiliation with the Texas Rangers, Hugh Darvish made a couple of starts down here. Uh, which was just unbelievable to be around him and, and the media circus that, that kind of he brought with him. Um, Tim Lincecum was down here for a little while when he was trying to kind of have one more shot at, at making a major league roster. And so there's just there's so many things that we get to experience over the course of a year that are, are so unique and so just something you never thought you get to see in your lifetime or, or like I still have days five years later after working here that I walk into the office like I can't believe that I work here that this is where – I spend all my days and, you know, getting to talk to you, Darvish, or, you know, watch a monster truck rally from my office. I mean, all these <laughs> things. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, just an awesome place to work. So when those major league guys come in, are they like making friends with the players there? Or are they just like kind of rolling in headphones on, they play and they leave? Like what's kind of the dynamic of the team? Cause that's gotta be kind of weird if you've already kind of made it and you're playing with guys trying to come up on the come up, you know? Yeah. You know, that's a good point. It's, it's been so cool to me. Every, every time we've had a, a rehab assignment, guy come in they've just been unbelievable they've been so good to us they've been so good to the minor league players they with a lot of guys that are, are, are major league stars you have the jose altuve and carlos correa i think i'll use as, as the most recent examples and you know guys that everybody knows but they were there they they got drafted they went through the minor league system they spent the years they put in the work they put in the hours the effort the long bus rides and the long flights and the 6 a.m wake-up call so they know what these these minor league guys go through and they're there to encourage them and to help them where they can. And it was so cool when, when Carlos Correa was here, just, he was so down to earth. He was, you know, making friends with the younger guys. He was kind of being a resource for them. And from, from our standpoint on the media side, he was so gracious with our media, with our fans signing autographs. And the other kind of fun thing that it's sort of like a little tradition, I guess, with, with the rehab assignment guys is that they traditionally will buy the meal that night. And so a lot of times what we do here in Round Rock, and I'm sure a lot of other clubs, we have a, an executive chef on staff that, that makes meals for these guys. They usually have something light when they get to the ballpark, you know, around two, three o'clock, and then they have a big dinner after the game's over. And so when a major leaguer comes in, they'll buy just ridiculous. I mean, they have steaks and they've got ribs and you Darvish catered this massive PF Chang spread. And the really cool thing about when Darvish was here, um, he, bought food for both us and the visiting team which i had never seen before so I, it was just it was it's so cool to have these guys here and even if it's just for a game or two and there's nowhere else i don't think that you can be that close to the field that close to these guys for as as little as you have to pay to get in and it's just such a such a unique experience i mean if you paid six bucks at, at any major league park you'd be you know the 400 level <laughs> way the heck up you know can't even see these guys in here you can sit on the berm and you can have you Darvish in the bullpen that's literally, you know, cut into the berm. He's, he could be five feet away from you. So um, it's a blast. I, I, you know, you never want these guys to get hurt. And obviously our goal is to support the Houston Astros and to provide the best possible facility for them to develop their talent, to, you know, cultivate their minor leaguers and, and ultimately make those guys major leaguers and contribute to the club. But man, when we can step in and we can host those rehab guys and, and help them get back healthy and get back full strength, it's a, it's a blast for us. So this is maybe a little bit different of a question, seeing as though you guys are AAA and, you know, obviously right there before the majors. But has there been anyone that's come through that you've known, like, surefire, this guy's going to be an MLB superstar? Oh, I yeah. I, I think for me, the very first time I ever saw Jordan Alvarez, it was like, this guy just should not be in AAA. And as soon as he <laughs> leaves, he is never coming back. Uh, he has hit some of the longest home runs I've ever seen inside this stadium. I mean, he just... I mean, if you've never been up close to him, he is massive. He is a, a large human being. He has a ton of power. And, you know, everybody talks about the defense and, oh, where do you play him? And is it the outfield? But uh, this guy can make a career out of out of DHing. And if they need to stick him in left field or, or what have you for a few games, I mean, he's going to be successful just because of his bat alone. 
I think another guy, too, for me, going back to the Rangers days, we played – it was one of the very first games I ever worked, but we had a, a exhibition series – or an exhibition game between the Express AAA guys and the Frisco Rough Riders AA guys. And so Joey Gallo was, of course, on the AAA side at that point, and he was batting against a, a AA pitcher, but he hit a home run that went – it had to have gone maybe – 440 450 feet like into our playground area it, like beyond the outfield concourse and it was like oh man this guy you know he's gonna have a career doing this but that's the fun part of it too it's like there's there's guys that are prospects and they've got all these highly touted and all these numbers and stats and you're like all right cool you're looking out for him but there's so many times too where guys come through that aren't that way that they maybe don't have the accolades or don't have the publicity and they catch on and, and stick and I think a good example of that from last year was Jose Urquidy, the a starting pitcher. He was, I think, started the year in double A or, or high A ball and, and worked his way up. And he came to Round Rock and was just untouchable. Got called up to the Astros. He ended up putting in huge innings in, in the postseason. Uh, he saved them there at the end of the World Series toward the toward the end of that series against the Nationals. But it's another really fun part of this job is to see these guys come through and develop and um, yeah, ultimately turn into major leaguers. So the last couple of weeks with baseball being out, I've just been cranking uh, baseball fight videos just because <laughs> why not? Are, are there guys in the minors that are scrapping every now and then? Like, are you having some benches clearing? Does the bullpen jog in or is it just kind of like everyone just looks at each other like, come on, man, why'd you do that and jog off? Like, what's, what happens at that level? It is not nearly as prevalent in the minor leagues as it is in the major leagues. I think kind of a couple of reasons for that. It's It's obviously more developmental here. So guys are are working on improving and doing what they need to do to, to get to the major league level. So, you know, everybody wants to win. The goal is to win. And if you're going to be in the minor leagues, you want to win and you want to win a championship. But winning's not the end of the world, right? You're not at this level. If, if you win 100 games and you develop and you go to the major leagues, awesome. If you lose 100 games, but you're developing and you're going to the major leagues, you know, just as well. So I think from that standpoint, it's there's less, you know, heated kind of personal. You don't see like the personal – rivalries between the players and between the teams we have rivalries you know front offices to front office uh with san antonio and with nashville and some of our counterparts um but of course that's off the field and we're competing on awards for promotions and different things uh, but i will say and and jason you might have been out of this game with us i can't remember uh th there's been one actual physical brawl in this stadium's history it happened i think it was 2017 the, uh, we were still with the Rangers. We were playing Oklahoma City Dodgers, uh, who, of course, is a Los Angeles affiliate. And they, it was toward the end of the year. We played them, you know, 18 times. And it's just they were beating each other up on the field, back and forth, back and forth. And it was kind of a, a hotly contested series. And it was uh, – this is another quirky minor league thing. But that game that night was um, – it was like a Nickelodeon night that we were doing out here. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> different Nickelodeon – well, our players were wearing these god-awful – like orange Nickelodeon uniforms that had like green slime. You mean super sweet uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so that just added to the allure of this whole thing. So we're wearing these crazy uniforms and I, I have gone down. I, I'm usually, for my role, in up in the press box, I sit next to our official scorer and we chart the game and he keeps score and we keep track of pitchers coming in and out and any sort of media requests we might get. We're cutting highlights. We're doing social media. And so I had actually had my assistant step in and kind of run the game. I went down, my parents were at the game. So I'm down in, in kind of our club area talking to them. And I'll never forget my, I had my back to the field, which is a no, no for me. I probably should learn that lesson. I'm never going <laughs> to be anywhere where I can't see what's going on. And my sister, our sister, all of a sudden kind of raised, she's like, Oh, look. And I look up <laughs> to the, the monitor, like from the ceiling, I didn't have a great view of the field and it's just all out both benches. Everybody's kind of in this melee. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. So I, bust it back up to the press box and trying to figure out what happened. And uh, I guess there was a, one of our, our batters was barking at the pitcher and the pitcher said something back to him as he's walking up the first baseline. And, you know, he said the wrong thing and they just start going at it. And um, he, he took one right to the top of the forehead uh, a swing. And, you know, then it was just broke loose from there. The bullpens come in the whole thing. So that was the only time I've seen like a full bore benches clearing. We've had incidents where guys, you know, get up on the rail and yell back and forth and, uh, crazy ejections where guys just, you know, go nuclear and start throwing equipment and the whole thing. But that, that brawl was, yeah, that was something to, to behold. I mean, imagine getting your face rocked by a guy in an orange and slime yeah, uniform. Sponge jersey, uh-huh. <laughs> like, that's got to feel yeah, even exactly. worse. <laughs> well, what was funny for us on the administrative side, you know, 
we work very closely with the Pacific Coast League and with minor league baseball on when there is disciplinary stuff like that, when there when there's ejections, when there's contact with an umpire, when there's a fight, you know, if there's anything like that. So we have to cut video highlights, not highlights, but we have to, you know, cut the raw video, all the different angles, anything we have that we can turn over to, to minor league baseball and their disciplinary board and whoever that, that makes these decisions and players get fined and suspended and whatever, depending on different situations. But we were going back and forth on this video, getting this video over to them. And it just, these uniforms, every time we're watching the highlights of this. And then of course the bullpen comes and here comes all these guys in these neon orange and green uniforms running through the outfield. And it was, that was a very minor league baseball day. I mean, are you guys posting those highlights on like Twitter and Instagram too? Cause like, I feel like that would be, <laughs> That'd be like the most viewed clip of the day. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that'd be your best post of the year. Almost a dude in a SpongeBob uni rocking some guy. It was, it was a, yeah, it was an experience. That's for sure. I don't know if I was there for that. I know I missed the bucking and trucking and I'm, I'm very disappointed in that, but I don't, maybe I remember cutting through the video and laughing up in your office or something, but uh, yeah, huh? But going forward, what I don't want to miss this season is the hairy man, hairy men, hairy man, one man. But your upcoming collegiate yep. baseball season that you guys are hosting, talk a little bit about that, kind of what, how that came to be, and uh, really what, what's going on out at the uh, ballpark this season. Yeah, of course. So we, you know, kind of looking big picture at this, our, our organization, our goal, and I would think every minor league club across the country would say this, is we want to provide baseball to this community. We want to give back to the community. We want to, again, be that place of entertainment, a place of almost solace where you can kind of forget about whatever you have, whatever else you have going on, drink a beer, have a hot dog, watch a baseball game with your friends, do the whole thing. So that that's at the end of the day, whether we're a Rangers affiliate, an Astros affiliate, triple A, double A, whatever, we just want to play baseball. We, we want to provide that to our community. And so this whole situation where their contracts go back and forth. And again, we're stuck in limbo. It's just, it's been hard on us. We can't be able to fulfill that mission and to do what we all love to do and, and want to do and give back. And so, the Texas Collegiate League is an established summer collegiate wood bat league that, you know, they give college players a chance to get some more innings in, get some more at-bats in over the course of the summer when, when the, the NCAA season is over, you know, before these kids go back for the fall semester. So, of course, with the pandemic and with everything shut down, there's very few collegiate summer leagues that were able to operate. Well, of course, Texas, with, with the way the state's reopening and the different guidelines, Texas was, was allowed to be able to host something like this. So they kind of had the idea to, hey, let's kind of expand this. Let's utilize existing facilities, existing teams and resources, and, and try to get some more college kids to, to have a summer season. And so many of these, these kids, too, lost their, their season. You know, I know, of course, some of them go back and, and get that eligibility back from the NCAA, and there's a whole other process for that. But as far as right now in June, you're, there's no baseball for these kids. So they kind of approached us and several of our counterparts at minor league teams across the state of Texas and uh, Oklahoma and Louisiana said, "Hey, would this be something you're interested in?" And we kind of looked at it and said, "You know, we this fulfills our goal to to be able to host baseball games and, and to be a you know pillar in the community from that standpoint." But you start to look at the amount of talent that is in Central Texas, whether it be collegiate players that play at universities in, in Central Texas or collegiate players that could be playing anywhere but that are from Central Texas. Maybe they, they went to high school here, they're home living with their parents over the summer. And we said, you know, we've got a chance to use some of our existing connections that we've built through the Express and, and field a really competitive and really fun team. So that's kind of the genesis of how this all came about. And I don't know if you want to get too deep into the actual hairy men um, part of this, but I mean, one of the of initial course. conversations we had was about – just the, the confusing. You know, we, we don't want to send the message to our fans that our season's been canceled when it hasn't um, officially been canceled yet. We don't want to confuse people to think, hey, oh, the Express are back. Uh, these are going to be Astros minor leaguers. No, it's it's two separate leagues. It's collegiate players. They're amateurs. They're not getting paid. It's, you know, it's, the sport's the same, but the parameters are, are vastly different. So we decided we were going to rebrand this, this summer uh, Texas Collegiate League team as the Round Rock Harry Men. And so kind of the genesis of that, we every year, uh, one of our, our minor league baseball theme nights is called What Could Have Been. And we, for one weekend series every year, rebrand as a a different name for when the team was founded. So when the Express were founded in 2000, of course, we're named after Nolan Ryan, the Ryan Express. He's he's our owner and founder. And 
but there were several other good ones. The Fire Ants was one. The Armadillos was one. We were the Jackalopes one year. But this year, we were going to be the Hairy Men, which is a kind of a nod to a, a local legend here in, in the city of Round Rock, where basically the story was Round Rock, you know, back in the day, kind of pioneer days, the wild, wild west, settlers, the whole deal. Round Rock was a kind of a pivotal point geographically with, with the cattle drive coming through. It came, you know, all the way through Kansas, into Texas, into New Mexico, going west. And you had the settlers moving from east to west as well. And they kind of all came to a point through Round Rock. Well, Brushy Creek is a, a creek that runs through our town, kind of east to west. And there is a literal round rock in the middle of, of Brushy Creek that the legend was, you know, if um, – if you could see the top of the rock, then it was safe to cross. The water wasn't too deep. But if the rock's underwater and it's too deep, your your wagon's going to fall over, your horses drown, the whole thing. So <laughs> off of this this um, part of the, the history and the geography was born this legend that this family was, was coming through on the cattle trail and the, they had a little boy that was on the back and he fell off the wagon and, you know, got lost on the trail and the family kept going and they look up you know, 100 miles away, and the kid's gone. I don't know where he is. And so he kind of grows up in the wilderness. He turns into, like, this hairy, you know, hermit guy that's living in the woods. And uh, the way the story goes, he's he kind of terrorizes the, the settlers that come through. And he's hitting their carts with sticks and scaring the horses and the whole thing. Well, part of this legend was he would sit up in the, the tree canopy, like above the, the trails, and he would drag his feet on the tops of the, the wagons and bang it with sticks and you know, the whole deal. And one day he slipped and fell from the tree and was trampled by the horses and the, the cattle drive that was going through. And so he's, you know, haunts the area. And we actually have on the, the northwest side of Round Rock a, a road called Harry Man Road. And it's a, actually a really pretty stretch of road. That, like I said, the trees kind of go up over the top like a canopy. And um, it, it's a really cool piece of road. And you can kind of visualize, you know, how this story came to be and how it came about. So it was too perfect. Like we, this is so minor league baseball this is such a perfect rendition so we already had the jerseys we have hats we have merchandise logos branding we had the whole thing ready to go for this express theme night and we thought hey let's let's blow this thing out let's do it for 30 games let's apply this instead of doing the what could have been let's give it to the the texas collegiate league and and share this legend with our folks and of course it's such a a catchy you know what the heck is round rock harry man you see the logo and the whole deal so it's um one of those um Again, a very minor league baseball type uh, type atmosphere. Fantastic branding and marketing on all the Harry Man stuff, by the way. Oh, it's been fun. It's been, and it's, we talked about the wild, wild west, but I mean, it really is. This is a new territory for us and for, you know, the league. And so we're having fun and you know, like, you know what, it's 30 games, it's college kids. Let's, let's blow it out and have a good time and get back to affiliated ball, hopefully late this summer or in 2021. <laughs> Hank, you got anything else? No, I'm good. I, I thought that was great. I loved hearing about the, what was the monster truck thing again? What was it called? Bucking and Trucking. Bucking and Trucking, the greatest yeah. name of anything I've ever heard today. I fight for us to do that event again. Do yeah, it every so every month, once a month, <laughs> <laughs> every summer. I have I do have one question left for you. Sure. You have known this about me for a long time now, and I've asked this many times, but now that I have you with the pressure of the podcast, the Harry Man are playing 15 home games which means 15 first pitches at Dell Diamond. When am I throwing out a first pitch at a baseball oh, you, game? You might be onto something. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, interesting. On behalf of uh, of Monkey Sports and, and the Baseball, baseball Monkey, Monkey Podcast, I think we might have to uh, put some together. All right, I'll, I'll cut you a deal. How about this? You you guys have a corporate outing out here. Bring all your buddies. We're going to socially distant. We're going to do the whole thing. Okay. And uh, we'll do your first pitch. How about that? All right, I'll see what I can do. We'll get our entire <laughs> Monkey Sports Media team out there for a corporate outing. There you go. And I will gas one that's down the middle. It's a natural tie-in, right? The monkey, hairy man, it's, I mean, they're... We've got a monkey suit. I'll bring it out. There you Please go. Don't. I'll even You're gonna be, be so your sweaty mascot in that. for a game or two. You're going to be so sweaty in that. <laughs> it, it, it makes too much sense. I'm saying. I'm saying. Are we'll you, be in touch. Our wait, people will be in touch with your quick, people. Quick first pitch question to Jason specifically. Are you going to be on the mound or are you going to go the step in front of the mound? Because I've heard going a step in front of the mound is the way to do it. I think you got to go on the mound, right? I've oh, just I've heard mound, from people sure. that have done the pitch that the step in front of the mound is definitely the play. I mean, I could probably if if the Harry Man are still looking, I've I've probably still have some collegiate baseball uh, eligibility oh, left. Eligibility. Yeah, I could probably get out there. 
We'll get, we'll get, we'll be in touch. We'll get our people in if touch. If you need someone to bat point oh oh one and throw out first pitches, <laughs> Jason's got you. There you go. I don't think that's there generous. That means I'm going to make contact with. At least one guarantee pitch. you, Jason, you would be the only player on our team representing the University of North Texas baseball. I'm saying there we go. Green, now baby. we're talking. GMG, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Andrew, thank you so much. This was great. Mom always said we needed to have a sports show together. This is our next best thing, doing a podcast. So appreciate, as always, you coming on. And, uh, yeah, this was fun. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, thanks, guys. Always love to get to talk about, about baseball and what I get to do every day. So I appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully we'll uh, get the Express out and playing again very soon. But uh, in the very meantime, soon. we'll talk to you. All right. See you guys later. Thanks again to Andrew Feltz of the Round Rock Express for coming on the Monkey Ball Podcast brought to you by Monkey Sports. And thank you guys for tuning in to the Monkey Sports Podcast. Stay subscribed. Always appreciate the support of content. While we're talking content, check us out. We now have TikTok at Monkey Sports on TikTok. Be sure to give it a follow. We'll try to make you laugh here and there as we typically do. We'll be back again next week for Off the Ice, the official Hockey Monkey podcast. Be sure to stay tuned for that. Should be a rip-roaring time talking about the NHL. Pretty much getting up and ready to go. We will see you then. We'll be back for another episode of Monkey Ball in a month's time. Until then, promo code PODCAST10, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, 10% off your entire order at BaseballMonkey.com. Check us out on social, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. We are everywhere you are. We'll see you next time.